Welcome to an introduction to managerial accounting brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This is the second of two short podcasts on decentralization and performance evaluation. In this podcast, we shall focus on the ideas of residual income, economic value added, and finally take a look at the balanced scorecard approach. We finished the first podcast by considering a problem with return on investment. Let us refresh by starting with this point. A manager has a current return on investment for a division of 21% and the cost of capital was 10%. Suppose a new investment projected a new rate of return on investment of 15%. The return is greater than the cost of capital, so there is no reason to turn down the investment. However, the new return is lower than the current return on on investment, and if the manager is evaluated on return on investment, then the project will be turned down. This leads to underinvestment. Economic value added starts with the concept of residual income. Residual income is the profit after taxes that is in excess of the required profit. Residual income is the net operating profit after taxes less the required profit, which is net operating profit less the cost of capital multiplied by the investment. We know that the investment figure is equal to the total assets less non-interesting bearing current liabilities. Now we have a measure for residual income. Consider two possible projects. In the first, the return on incremental investment is 11%, but the cost of capital is 12%. Residual income analysis will refuse the project since the residual income is reduced. This will reduce the temptation for overinvestment. Project B has a return on incremental investment of 14%, with the cost of capital at 12%. Residual income would increase so this reduces the temptation for underinvestment. Economic value added starts by making adjustments in residual income. The adjustments add back the expenses of research and development since these can create future benefits and for marketing since this is expected to give a future benefit. Under GAAP both R&D and marketing are expenses so we are adjusting these. Thus, economic value added becomes the NOPAT figure after adjustment, less the cost of capital multiplied by the adjusted figure for the investment. To illustrate this, we consider the performance of Tiger Turbines, which has high research and development costs to produce wind turbines and underwater turbines. The figures shown relate to the income statements for each year. Our particular interest is in the research and development figures that are highlighted. We also need access to information from the balance sheets for the two years we are considering. And we shall need the figures for research and development for the two previous years. The first stage of the process is the calculation of the figure for the adjusted NOPAT. So, we are adding back the interest expense and adding back the research and development figures. Research and development is being amortized over three years, so we need to reduce the figures for amortization for the current year and for the two previous years. We put in the figure for taxes at 40% and we have now the adjusted figures for net operating profit after taxes for each of the two years. Let us be clear about what is happening here. Why add back interest? To prevent double counting, interest is already included in the calculation for cost of capital. Why are we adding adding back R&D? Because we are treating it as an intangible asset. The second stage will be to determine the figures for the adjusted investment. There are two steps here. The first is to add in the unamortized figures for research and development. 
Then subtract the figures for non-interest bearing current liabilities. In this case these are for accounts payable, accrued liabilities and taxes payable. We now have the figures we need for the adjusted investment. The final step is to carry out the calculation for economic value added. We have figures for adjusted NOPAT. If we assume a figure of 17% for the cost of capital, then we multiply the figures for adjusted investment by 0.17. We then subtract these figures from the adjusted NOPAT to give the economic value added figures. Why have we got differences here for each year? Well, if we look, the investment was up in 2012. This was shown in the balance sheet. However, it shows us that income did not rise sufficiently. The th three th measures used so far, profit, return on investment and economic value added, are all measures relating to past activity. They tell us whether past actions have increased shareholder value. These are a good guide to future performance, but management will also be considering what needs to be done today in order to create future shareholder value. One such method is the balanced scorecard method. The balanced scorecard is forward-looking and considers the perspective of finance, customers, internal processes and learning and growth. What exactly do we mean by these perspectives? The financial goals may include income, return on assets, growth in sales, improving cash flow and reducing expenses. How can the company achieve these goals? Customer goals include improved satisfaction, retention, obtaining new custom, improving market share and delivering goods on time. How does the company ensure that these expectations are being met? Internal processes can include reducing the number of defects, operating plant to a higher capacity and looking at materials turnover. What steps are being taken to improve these? Learning and growth relates to training, keeping employees and the development of new products. Can the company take steps to improve and innovate? In this diagram we piece together these to show how they may be related. If skills at a call center are improved, it should lead to more accurate responses, which will improve customer satisfaction and thereby contribute to increasing sales. For each of these perspectives, a measurement is suggested so that progress is monitored effectively. In order to use an approach such as a balanced scorecard, there are a number of keys for a successful strategy. Targets have to be clear. Everybody needs to know what the company is trying to achieve. There must be clear action that is taken to achieve targets. For example, if training is needed, it has to be given to those who are going to use the training. Each employee must recognize the responsibility they have to achieve a target. If training is given, there must be adequate funding made available for the purpose. Finally, there must be support for any new initiative. This ends our second podcast on decentralization and performance evaluation, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.